From the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska, this is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. Manly Hot Springs, located 160 miles or 258 kilometers west of Fairbanks, Alaska, marks the end of the road where civilization meets wilderness. The boat landing in Manly Hot Springs offers the last portage for fishermen, trappers, and wanderers to launch their boats and travel further up the icy Tanana River. Because the road ends in Manly, residents admit they see their share of drifters and people trying to escape from somewhere or something. When Michael Silka arrived in Manly on Monday, May 13, 1984, folks accepted him as another straggler, searching for a new life. They should have been terrified. Michael Silka was about to forever change sleepy Manly Hot Springs. Welcome to Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I'm your host, Robin Bearfield, and I'm broadcasting from the heart of the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge on Kodiak Island in Alaska. Michael Silka grew up in Hoffman Estates, Illinois, and classmates would call him as a nonconformist from an early age. Neighbors described his parents as good people, but stated Michael was always different. Teachers remember Silka as a difficult student who often caused trouble. When Silka was a juvenile and young man, police arrested him numerous times for unlawful use of a weapon, burglary, shoplifting, and resisting arrest. Silka loved hunting, fishing, and firearms. A neighbor convinced him to join the Army after he graduated from high school in 1977. And in 1981, the Army transferred Silka to Fort Wainwright near Fairbanks, where he began to dream about living in the wilderness of interior Alaska. Silka wanted to subsist and make money selling furs as a trapper. According to Army records, Silka earned an expert marksman's rating with the M16 rifle and grenade launcher. While at Fort Wainwright, though, records show Silka experienced several run-ins with military police, including an assault charge and an arrest for discharging a firearm in the barracks. After the Army discharged him, Silka returned to Illinois and worked at a variety of jobs. He was arrested two separate times on weapons violations and made several court appearances. But on October 26, 1983, he missed his hearing, skipped bond, and fled. A warrant for his arrest was issued on December 20, 1983. Shortly after Christmas in 1983, Silka showed up in Dauphin, Manitoba, Canada, in a brown Dodge sedan. He stayed in Dauphin throughout the winter, preparing his vehicle for the drive to Alaska. In early spring 1984, Silka drove to Alaska. He arrived with a canoe lashed to the top of his sedan and rented a small shack at mile 4.7 of China Pump Road on the edge of Fairbanks. Silka chose the most remote shack in the area, and neighbors found him strange and threatening. On the afternoon of April 28th, a neighbor woman chopped wood and chatted with her friend, Roger Culp. Silka walked past his two neighbors and suddenly stopped and picked up a large stick, angrily beating it against the woman's chopping block, sending debris flying into the air. He said, this is how you do it and then walked away, leaving the woman and Culp stunned by his violent behavior. Silka terrified the woman, but his actions angered 28-year-old Culp, who followed Silka back to Silka's shack. The woman tried to discourage Culp from further interacting with Silka, but he told her he would be back in 15 minutes. 
A short while later, the woman heard gunshots, and Culp did not return. The woman was so terrified, she hid in her cabin with a loaded shotgun by her door and stayed there for two days. For unexplained reasons, she did not report Culp's disappearance to authorities for nine days. The following day, another neighbor, Wendy Hooker, knocked on Silka's door to confront him about a moose hide she believed he had stolen. She noticed a small pool of blood outside his door, but she assumed he had recently killed a small game animal. When Silka didn't answer her knock, Wendy walked around his cabin to the back, where she saw a three-foot by six-foot mound of freshly turned snow and blood soaking up through the snow in her footprints. Wendy again knocked on Silka's door. No one answered, but she felt certain Silka was inside the cabin. Wendy told her friend Tom about the incident, and he went to Silka's cabin. Silka admitted to Tom he had taken Wendy's moose hide and promised to return it. Wendy and Tom told their friend Don Hopkins about Silka's strange behavior and the blood behind his cabin. And when the trio realized Roger Culp had disappeared, Hopkins called the Alaska State Troopers. For some reason, though, the troopers misunderstood what Hopkins was trying to tell them. They thought Hopkins said that both Culp and Silka had disappeared, and he suspected Culp had killed Silka. They thought Silka was a possible murder victim. Two troopers warily approached Silka's cabin. They knocked on the door, but when no one answered, they circled to the backyard, where they found the mound of snow, but did not see any blood. They dug into the snow, but only found a moose hide. Another hide hung from a nearby tree. The troopers returned to Silka's front door and saw a small amount of blood near the door, but not enough to suggest a homicide had recently occurred. They knocked on Silka's door again, and this time Silka stuck his head out of the door, keeping his right hand hidden. When the man identified himself as Michael Silka, investigators assumed nothing was amiss, since Silka was still alive. Silka explained he had been cleaning moose hides for some of his hunter friends, and the hides were the source of the blood on the snow. Since the troopers saw no evidence of a crime, and Silka was still alive, they saw no reason to inquire further into the incident. Later, one of the troopers recalled how Silka kept one of his hands out of sight the entire time they talked to him. Was he holding a gun? And would he have shot them if they'd asked the wrong question? Several days later, Culp's female friend finally reported Culp's disappearance to the troopers and told them she'd heard gunshots after Culp followed Silka back to his cabin. Troopers returned to Silka's shack with a warrant to search the shack and the grounds around it. They found the shack abandoned. Silka had disappeared. They spent two days searching the area around the shack and found patches of peat covering the blood stains. They sent samples of the blood to the crime lab in Palmer, and the results confirmed the blood was human. When Silka fled Fairbanks, he drove his battered, brown and white 1974 Dodge Monaco, filled with hunting gear, guns, and ammunition, and with his canoe mounted on the roof, 160 miles west from Fairbanks down a rutted, muddy road. The road was so bad, the trip would have taken him approximately five hours. He stopped when he got to the end of the road and set up camp near the boat landing in Manly Hot Springs, a tiny town on the banks of the turbulent Tananal River. Prospector John Karshner founded Manly Hot Springs in 1902, when he homesteaded near several hot springs in the area. The region quickly grew and became a resort for steamboat passengers and gold miners in the area. The town expanded to 500 residents, but the population nosedived when mining activity began to decline a decade later. By 1984, only 50 hardy souls called Manly Hot Springs home. The Manly Roadhouse, built in 1903, served as the only restaurant and hotel in town. When Michael Silka arrived in Manly on Monday, May 13, 1984, 
Most residents found the 25-year-old man strange and a little scary. Silka told Patricia Lee, who ran the Manly Roadhouse with her husband, Bob, he could smell clams, even when they were covered by six feet of water. Another Manly resident described Silka as okay but odd, and she said he seemed obsessed with a large knife he kept sharpening. On Thursday, May 17, 1984, six Manly residents visited the Manly Hot Springs boat landing between noon and 2.30 p.m. Joe McVeigh and Dale Matajaski drove to the boat landing to launch McVeigh's boat. McVeigh, 38, a wounded Vietnam veteran, lived with his wife Alice across the river from Manly. Matajaski, 24, lived nearby with his wife Kristen. Albert Hagen, Jr., 27, drove to the boat landing with a load of brush to dump into the river. Lyman Klein, 36, Joyce Klein, 30, and the Klein's two-year-old son, Marshall, drove to the boat landing on their four-wheeler for a family outing. Joyce was pregnant with the couple's second child. While no one realized it at first, another area resident also visited the boat landing sometime between noon and 2.30 p.m. Fred Burke, 30, a trapper, boated from his camp upriver down the river to the boat landing because he wanted to work on the truck he kept in Manly. Around 4 p.m., Manly resident Sabi Gertler drove to the boat landing with a car full of children who wanted to watch the mighty Tanana River boil and churn while the winter ice broke apart and sailed down the river. Sabi reported she saw a quiet landing, but she noticed that Michael Silka's canoe was half off his car. When Sabi returned to the boat landing two hours later, Silka's canoe was gone. When Joe McVeigh failed to return home, his wife Alice drove to the landing and found Joe's boat still there and a six-pack of beer in his truck. She immediately began to worry about her husband. When Joe still hadn't returned home by noon the next day, Alice called the Alaska State Troopers in Fairbanks. Troopers took her report, but they thought Joe McVeigh would probably show up within the next few hours. Gradually, other friends and relatives began to worry about their missing loved ones. The relatives gathered and began comparing notes about when they last saw the missing residents. One person drove to the landing and noticed the strange car. They feared this person could also be missing, so they called the troopers and relayed his license plate number. When troopers ran the plate, they realized it belonged to Michael Silka a man wanted for the murder of Roger Culp in Fairbanks. Now troopers were concerned. At least seven people had disappeared, and one of the missing was a suspected murderer. Troopers began arriving in Manly at 2 a.m. on Saturday, May 19th, and started an aerial search of the river at the break of dawn during the long daylight hours in May. They found splotches of blood and drag marks through the blood at the boat landing. They also found used cartridge casings, and they feared Silka shot the missing people and then threw their bodies into the raging river. Perhaps he'd argued with and then shot McVeigh and Matajaski, the first two of those missing to arrive at the boat landing. As the other victims arrived and saw what he had done, he murdered them to cover his tracks. By Saturday afternoon, more than 15 troopers scoured the Tanana River and its tributaries. The search included boats, two helicopters, and three small airplanes, and involved members of the Alaska State Troopers Special Emergency Response Team, or CERT. CERT members carry automatic weapons and are trained for high-risk operations. And they understood they were chasing a dangerous man who at this point had little to lose. They also knew Silka had been a sharpshooter in the Army and was known to own a variety of firearms. 
The left side doors of the Bell Jet Ranger helicopters were removed for the search. The two sharpshooters sat in the left-hand front and rear seats, feet on the skid and facing outward. In one of the helicopters, Trooper Troy Duncan sat in the left rear seat and Trooper Jeff Hall sat in the left front seat. Both were secured by seat harnesses and held Colt M16A1 rifles equipped with 20-round magazines. Trooper Captain Don Lawrence took charge of the operation and was in the helicopter with Duncan and Hall. Lawrence hoped to locate Silka and convince him to surrender, but he did not understand the adversary they were about to face. Not long after the helicopters departed Manly, the trooper saw a woman on the riverbank waving her arms in the air. One of the helicopters landed, and the troopers talked to her. She told them she was worried because her husband, Fred Burke, had gone down the river by boat to Manly on Thursday and had never returned to their cabin. Troopers now knew they were searching for seven missing area residents. On Saturday afternoon, the helicopter carrying Duncan Hall and Lawrence spotted a canoe tied behind Fred Burke's riverboat. The boat was tied to a tree in a slough. As the helicopter began to descend toward Silka, Lawrence used a bullhorn to tell Silka to surrender. Hall and Duncan saw Silka reach for something in his boat, and then Silka swung his .30-06 Ruger single-shot rifle toward the helicopter and fired. Duncan and Hall returned fire, but Silka's next shot hit Duncan in the face, killing him. Fragments from the bullet hit Lawrence in the face, wounding him. Hall returned fire and hit Silka eight times in the legs, body, and head, killing him instantly. According to Hall, the entire firefight lasted two seconds, with 25 rounds fired, two dead, and one wounded. An extensive search ensued to find the missing, but the icy, turbulent Tanana reluctantly releases the dead. By June 23, 1984, the bodies of Joe Burke, Lyman Klein, Dale Matajaski, and Larry McVeigh had been recovered from the river. Burke's wife discovered her husband's body 75 miles, or 120 kilometers, downstream from the Manly Hot Springs boat landing. The bodies of Joyce Klein, her young son Marshall, and Albert Hagen Jr. were never found. The body of Roger Culp in Fairbanks also was never recovered. Since the Army had honorably discharged Michael Silka, his father requested to have his ashes buried at the National Cemetery in Sitka. Manly residents were furious when they heard the news, but the military honored the request. His grave is unmarked. On one day, Manly Hot Springs lost more than 10% of its population. But in addition to the seven Manly residents, Roger Culpin Fairbanks and Trooper Troy Duncan, troopers suspect Silka's rampage might have included other victims. On May 11, 1984, before Silka arrived in Manly, several witnesses saw two strangers sitting in Silka's car with him. The pair were never seen again and troopers fear Silka picked up two hitchhikers and murdered them, possibly burying their bodies in the woods. No one could explain Silka's violent, deadly behavior. When he reached Alaska, he seemed to unravel, his actions becoming increasingly more bizarre, until he finally snapped and began killing. Thank you for listening, and please check the show notes to find references for this podcast. I am an author, and I write Alaska Wilderness Mysteries. I've written four novels set in the wilderness of Kodiak Island. I also write a monthly newsletter about murder and mystery in Alaska. Check the show notes for more information on my novels and my newsletter. I'll be back soon with the next episode of Murder and Mystery in the last frontier.